Well, I guess let's get the meeting going. Um, I would like to welcome everybody that's listening because uh, this last month has been a, a month that I never dreamed would ever happen uh, in my business world and then this sideline business also. But, uh, and I probably didn't take it serious enough when it first started out. But um, hopefully things will improve this month and we will be able to meet back next month. But um, until then, uh, thoughts and prayers with everyone. And uh, uh, I really do uh, wish the best for everyone because uh, I know there's a lot of people going through some hard times. So, um, again, thoughts and prayers with everyone. But um, this month, we're going to try something new with the Zoom. And who knows, maybe all our meetings will, will go to Zoom and uh, that will help our budget, Mike. <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, uh, we'll have Blake do the B talk and then questions. Uh, if anyone has questions during or after, uh, we'll try to answer any questions y'all have, especially the new beekeepers. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, but um, feel free to uh, uh, ask anything, I guess, pertinent to the meeting, and uh, we'll get the meeting going. And um, again, we got John, Blake, and myself. Um, and uh, then Mike Hatch can also help out there. So, and again, Mike, help. Uh, thank you for getting this all set up. Pretty last minute thing. Uh, everybody's been busy. So, um, again, just welcome everyone. And I'll just let Blake take over from here and we'll have some B talk for the month of April. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Russell. Um, it's pretty neat to be on here with you guys. Uh, I know that uh, I, I've been doing B Talk on and off for about 15 years, and I can honestly say this is the first time I've done it in sweatpants. So uh, <laughs> it's it's really very comfortable. Uh, I'm kind of becoming a fan of, of this Zoom thing. Uh, this is the first time uh, I have uh, like not worn a ball cap for 40 days. So uh, so yeah, this is uh, this is pretty neat. Um, Definitely want to echo what Russell said, though. I mean, it's hard times for a lot of folks, and um, definitely praying for all of you and um, hoping that it uh, resolves quickly and well for all of us. So um, I'm going to jump over into uh, PowerPoint mode um, so you guys can watch the, uh, the PowerPoint um, presentation. I don't think you'll be able to see me while we're doing that. Um, what a relief, right? Uh, but if you have questions, then put them in the uh, chat section and Mike's just going to kind of interrupt me um, during B talk and ask the questions. Cause once I'm in PowerPoint mode, I won't be able to see the chat function anymore. So, um, so if you have questions, by all means, um, put them in the chat function as I'm going through the PowerPoint and I'd be happy to stop and answer those. Um, so I'm going to see already, if we can get switched. Yeah. Go Mike, ahead, Mike. There's already one question. Uh, are you seeing a strong okay. flow yet? Okay. Um, great question. Um, are you guys able to, Mike, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Not yet. I have your, yeah. It was your face up there. See the CCHBA logo. Okay. Yep. You should. Nope. Oh, well, you know what? It would really help if I, uh, if I share my screen. Hey. Sorry guys. How about this? All right. Here we go. All right, let me get yeah. over here. Okay, now can we see it? Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. All right, yeah. and, you, and you can't, you cannot see me, right? Great. No. Okay, all right, great. Well, I can, I can do whatever I want on this side of the screen now as long as I talk, so <laughs> good to know. Um, yeah, so uh, great question um, as far as the honey flow. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna get into that in just a second. I've got some pictures of some flowers I took pictures of uh, day before yesterday. So we'll definitely talk a lot about the honey flow 
and kind of what uh, my crystal ball is telling me, uh, which is usually decently inaccurate, but I can certainly give it my best shot. Um, so let's see if I can. Here we go. So I took this yesterday night uh, here in North Texas. Um, <laughs> this is uh, this is what it felt like. Um, we were we were working these uh, early, early this morning, and my goodness, it was cold. And you know, it. I always I think I have about a six month memory because I always forget that we almost always have a cold couple of days around Easter every single year, and. Uh, and it's not that abnormal. I was uh, looking back at past weather reports and it's really cold and that always makes me panic a little bit when it comes to the bees. Um, but this is pretty normal to have a, a cold snap late in the year. And, uh, you know, we were working bees uh, at sun up this morning at, you know, 30 something degrees and, and you could never tell it was that and the bees were doing just fine. You could never tell it got cold. So as long as your bees had enough food, in store these cold snaps shouldn't affect them too much during the day today i mean it, it's gotten warm enough that the bees are actually flying around this afternoon um so despite the cold weather i wouldn't worry about it too much uh, i think that the bees in general have fared just fine through this cold snap and will for the next couple of days the only time i get really concerned about cold snaps like this is if i've just made splits um, and I'm concerned about the bee population in those splits. Uh, that's when I get concerned. And, and what you'll see sometimes if, if you made a split or made a nook and you didn't have enough bees to fully cover the brood, you'll get chilled brood. Um, so the brood will just chill a little bit and it'll kill the brood underneath the cap cells or the larva. And you'll see it. You'll go back three or four days later and you'll see the bees pulling that brood um, out of the cells because it, it got too cold and it died. So that's usually the worst of what you'll see uh, when, with cold snaps like this. If you had plenty of bees in your splits or in your nooks, as long as you had bees covering the front and back um, of each frame covered in brood, then they should be just fine. They ought to be able to keep it warm. So, so we've only got a few more days of this and then it's probably the last cold snap of the year and we're, we're home free. So let's talk a little bit just briefly. Um, this is obviously top of mind for everyone. I want to just give you a really uh, brief update on kind of what's going on in the industry, what we're seeing as a result of um, COVID-19. And locally and nationwide, uh, what we're seeing, th there's been a handful of very interesting things that have happened, um, not all negative for beekeeping. Um, number one, Honey sales for most have just skyrocketed, un unbelievably so. Um, on a nationwide scale, over the last six months, honey prices, uh, bulk honey prices, so you know, semi-low quantities or um, large quantities of honey have, have dropped more than we've seen in a couple of decades. I mean, it has just been kind of sickening to see how much honey, the, the price of U.S. honey in bulk has dropped. I mean, it went from you know, low two dollars a pound down to a buck twenty to a buck forty per pound. Um, commercially, it costs at least a dollar a pound to produce. Oftentimes, more like a dollar twenty to produce per pound, and and so kind of a devastating drop in, in the market for honey. Um, as soon as uh, the virus started hitting the U.S., obviously two things happened. One, people started panic buying food, uh, but secondly, everyone's at home. Um, about 30% of meals eaten in the United States are eaten in restaurants. Um, and obviously that's not happening nationwide. So 30% of meals suddenly came home and folks are buying uh, 20, 20 to 30%, at least more groceries than normal, which obviously includes a lot of honey. So kind of overnight, we've seen this incredible spike in demand uh, for honey. I think it's also, you know, people think of honey when they think of their health regimens, you know, cold and flu and allergies. And, um, you know, if I get this virus and, you know, I want hot tea and lemon and honey and, um, and honey's an everyday part of a lot of people's health regimens now. And so um, the demand for honey just, just went unbelievably through the root from you, for, for my company, you know, we've, we've packed more honey, in the past month than we did um, an entire and in, in, in an entire normal first quarter um, in, in one month. So um, 
so supply and demand um, now the honey price is coming back up in the United States so um, so that's kind of an interesting side effect of all this on on the honey market um, as far as uh, bees and beekeeping specifically uh, you guys are probably pr mostly have seen at this point that any beekeeping activity has been deemed an essential service so um, you know, beekeepers, whether commercial or even small scale, uh, even small scale food production and livestock care has been deemed an essential service. So if you need to go pick up bees or pick up supplies, um, you're able to do that no matter what kind of quarantines are in effect, which have been comparatively pretty loose in our state. But if it gets worse, then you should still be able to go out and get supplies uh, for your bees. And I know um, like Texas Bee Supply, you know, we've been able to stay open as an essential service supporting the ag community. So, um, so that's good um, that we're able to, you know, still go out and take care of our bees and get supplies, et cetera. There has been a definite shortage of sugar. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but um, it's kind of the key time of year to be feeding our bees. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, a lot of stores have imposed uh, limits on how much sugar you can buy or how much of any grocery item you can purchase. So that's certainly causing some issues for folks um, not being able to find sugar. So my only recommendation is, you know, you can hit a lot of stores. Um, the only other option I'm aware of is go to bee supply companies. Um, you know, our, Texas Bee Supply, Date Ant, Man Lake, you know, we all sell syrup, um, pre-made syrup. And, you know, I know all about the other companies. I'm sure they have plenty of it. We have plenty of it. Um, we're able to, you know, keep supplying syrup if you need it so um kind of the last side effect of this is uh you know um it's it's pretty interesting you know um there's a lot of uh you know for our company specifically i know for others as well there's a lot of um folks not buying bees obviously because the economy is concerning to a lot of folks you're breaking um, up like oh can you hear me now how's that can you hear me okay, Lisa? Can you hear me at all? Coming through good over here, Mike. Yeah, Blake, okay. I'm you fine as well, so it may just be there. Okay. Maybe. Okay. All right. So, so anyway, those are some of the effects of uh, that we're seeing on COVID nineteen. I mean, overall, not a huge effect on the beekeeping industry uh, because it's an essential service. So, um, so yeah, we'll just stay safe, and um, we'll certainly keep our thoughts and prayers uh, for all you guys. But so far. Those are the only effects. So, okay, let's talk about the honey flow and kind of what we're seeing uh, in, in North Texas. Uh, we're seeing the blue bonnets are blooming. Um, that's that upper right uh, picture there. Um, assuming your screen is the same as mine. Blackberries or dewberries are blooming. The, the, the yellow flower, the yellow mustard is in full bloom as well. That's a fantastic early nectar source for bees. Um, that's in full bloom. So we have a lot of the really great early nectar sources and early pollen sources in full bloom right now. This cold weather, it, you know, I think it is slowing them down a little bit, but not, you know, the, all these early plants are pretty uh, cold weather hardy. And so there's just a tremendous pollen flow. I think I've got a picture in a minute, but tremendous pollen flow. Um, this is, I find this really interesting. Um, the uh, little girl in red is not a flower. She escaped quarantine. Uh, she, uh, this, that's my youngest daughter. We, uh, we had to get out for a day. They, the kids were going absolutely crazy. So we um, went over to one of the fields where we keep bees in a long way from anyone. And we were checking out the uh, flowers and what, what the schedule was looking like as far as honey flow. Um, but uh, th this is several different pictures of scabiosa, also called uh, um, pincushion, I believe, is another or pinwheel pincushion. I think it's pincushion. Um, and this is one of the flowers I look for when I'm trying to decide when the honey flow starts. So usually, when this flower starts blooming, um, you're able. Th this is what tells me the honey flow is beginning. Um, and it usually starts blooming the last week of April or the first week of May. I mean, that's the normal. Um, the normal time when it when it begins blooming and as you can see I mean I was able to find a few plants in bloom now there weren't many I kind of had to hunt to find some that were that were in bloom but there were some blooming 
and then I saw some more today along the side of the road. So it's, it's about two, a good week to two weeks early. Um, and so that tells me that the honey flow is a bit ahead of schedule. Now this cold week in the middle of it is going to slow it down and probably put us back on schedule. But keep watching for those. If you're seeing a lot of those bloom in your area, that's a great sign the honey flow is coming into full swing. The other plant I really watch for is um, Indian blanket. Now that's not Indian paintbrush, Indian blanket or also Gallardia. This is another indicator in North Texas that our honey flow is in full swing. Now I haven't seen any of these blooming anywhere. They're, the plants are certainly there. Uh, but they still look like they're at least two weeks from bloom in most of the areas I've seen. So my prediction on the honey flow, you know, some areas we're seeing a pretty good trickle right now. I've talked to some people that are saying, hey, my bees are already filling up a super. And you always hear that, you know, there's always isolated areas that the bees are ahead of schedule and people are already putting supers on and they're already filling them up. Overall, what I'm seeing is it looks to me like it, it'll be a slightly early to on time uh, honey flow, which is usually around the first week of May is when the thing, the honey flow really starts kicking into to full gear. I don't really see it being late at all because, you know, we're already seeing some early blooms on scabiosa, but um, so that's kind of my prediction at the moment. I, I'm seeing some nectar starting to come in pretty strongly, um, but overall, yeah, I think, I think first week of May is a pretty good bet for our start date. Okay. If there aren't any questions on that, always feel free to put them in the chat box and, uh, and let me know. So we're definitely seeing abundant pollen. Um, this is a picture that represents a lot of what I saw even today, you know, going through, we were doing some late splits today and, uh, you know, just frame after frame of multicolored pollen and, in, in almost every hive. So there is no shortage of pollen right now. The bees are bringing in, all and all that they need and more uh, poll of pollen um, and nectar, not so much. I mean, we're going to talk about feeding in a minute because the, you know, we've certainly got some locations that are a little bit short on food and struggling to bring in enough nectar, which is very common this time of year. So um, pollen, we're doing great. Uh, nectar, we'll talk about in just a minute. So this is a time of year where most folks do splits. Uh, it's the key time to do splits, usually anywhere from the last week of March to the uh, about the third week of April is when most people do the splits in North Texas. And uh, Skip did a great job of talking about splits and how to make splits at the last CCHPA meeting in March, which was the perfect time to talk about it and make sure everybody knew how to do it. So I'm not going to talk about splits a lot, but I want to just quickly hit the high points uh, in case you weren't able to be in on that March meeting and, uh, and, and kind of go over the basics of, of how to make a split. It's, it can be pretty simple. The picture there is just an illustration um, of what the split should look like when you're done. Uh, so three frames of brood in the middle, a frame of honey and pollen on either side of the brood. And then on the other side of that, you've got honey or empty frame and then some empty frames on the outside. And, and that's kind of the, the setup you're looking for when you do a split. And when we talk about frames of brood, you know, we're not really talking about, um, you know, a frame with some brood on it. We're talking about a frame that is at least two thirds on both sides, solid brood. And brood means anything from eggs to larva to cat brood. So it doesn't have to just be cat brood. It can be, you know, eggs, it can be larva. Ideally in a split, you're going to go in for a mixture of all of those. So that's the format. Uh, you know, the basic concept of making a split is, uh, and, the, and the way I often recommend it, just because it's the simplest, is uh, go to your hive if it's two deep boxes. Uh, or if it's one deep, you know, bring an extra deep box out into the bee yard. And you're just equalizing brood between the two boxes. So if there's six frames of brood in the bottom and two frames of brood in the top, you know, you're just making sure you've got an equal number of frames of brood in both boxes. And you're kind of getting the top box and the bottom box in this format you see on the picture here. And then you're letting them sit until that night uh, or early the next morning so that the bees kind of equalize between the two boxes because you just disturbed them. 
and uh and then you break the two boxes apart and you put them on separate bottom boards and uh and then what i like to do is you can just wait um about two two to three days and then go back and look in your hives and whichever hive is starting to raise queens so whichever hive has queen cells that have royal jelly and larva in them that's the hive that needs a queen the one that doesn't have that and has eggs everywhere that's the one with the queen. And so it kind of prevents you from having to look for the queen. So while you're doing the split, you just pretty much ignore the queen completely. You do your split, um, separate the two boxes, and then uh, you can go back in a couple of days and see who's raising queen cells. And that's the one you can put your new queen in. Um, a couple of notes on that, you know, a lot of folks talk about walkaway splits. And so that's where you would just make your split and uh, you would not add a queen to the, you know, the split that needs it, you wouldn't add a queen. You just let them raise their own. And you can do that. Those are um, more successful later in the year than earlier in the year. But uh, the main disadvantage of those is just that it takes bees a long time to raise a new queen. And, uh, and your hive is going to just continue to go downhill in strength because they don't have a new queen laying, new brood hatching. And, and that's the main disadvantage. They, they can work. Um, I know a lot of people that do them successfully, but uh, if you really want to do things ideally and you really want to try to make a honey crop and keep your hive as strong as possible, putting a mated queen in there just really speeds up the process. So uh, another big issue a lot of people have with splits is uh, theoretically with splits, after you do it, you're supposed to move the split a couple miles away, um, which isn't always realistic for everyone. We don't all have different bee yards that we can move splits too. So a couple things you can do uh, if you don't want to move your split into a new location is uh, two, two things that we've done that I recommend and they work well. Uh, if you got, I would say, uh, under 10 hives and you are splitting a bunch of them, uh, you can just rearrange your whole bee yard and uh, not, not dramatically, but you know, make sure no hive is sitting where it was before. Make sure they all move uh, maybe two or three feet forward and two or three feet to one side. And you kind of disorient all the bees in the whole bee yard. And they oftentimes kind of end up drifting back to all the hives pretty equally. So that works pretty well. The other thing you can do is uh, whichever split has um, your old queen, um, give them, so the old queen that's going to keep playing, uh, they're going to kind of be ahead of schedule because they never lost their queen. You know, that queen in the new, in that split just is still laying, still going. And then the split that doesn't have a queen, they're kind of behind the schedule a little bit because they still have to have a queen introduced and um, she has to, ha you know, come out of her cage and start laying and that takes up to a week. So, um, so what I often do is um, just, you know, set the two hives a couple of feet from each other, but I give the split, uh, the one with, out a queen, an extra frame of brood and bees. So instead of putting three frames of brood in the one without a queen, I might put four frames of brood. And that kind of gives them just an extra boost. And you might have some drifting going on, but at least that, that, uh, that hive without a queen has a little more brood um, to co help compensate for that. Um, the other key thing with splits is uh, checking back. So checking back and making sure the queen, if you introduced one, was accepted. Um, and that can, if you, once you put a queen in a split, I would usually go back about seven days later and all I'm looking for is eggs. And if I see eggs, I close up the split and don't bother them further. Um, if you don't see eggs, I still close it up and, uh, give them a couple more days and go back and look for eggs. You really don't want to spend a whole lot of time in a new split with a new queen, uh, because the bees are still not hundred percent sure who that new queen is. And they might actually uh, kill her if you open the hive and have it open for too long. Her pheromones dissipate and the bees don't really recognize her anyway. And they can sometimes kill the queen. And so when I'm doing check backs, I'm, I'm very quick. You know, I'm in and out of the hive in a couple minutes or less. So when I'm, when I'm checking to see if that queen was accepted, I'm opening the hive, giving them a little puff of smoke, pulling up a couple of the center frames, looking for eggs. And if I, if I see eggs, put it back and leave it at least another week before doing anything intense. Um, if I don't see eggs, I wait, like I said, a couple more days, um, go back and look again. If I still don't see eggs at day 10 or 11, 
unfortunately, then I typically assume the queen was not accepted and they probably killed her. And at that point, you can do one of two things. You can maybe give them another frame of brood and just let them raise their own queen, or you can get another queen and introduce a second queen to the hive. Um, Mike, the last, yeah, yes, Mike. I, I missed a question um, a little bit earlier. Someone was sure. asking, I assume your graphic that you're showing, is that split the source hive or the destination or equally both? And I think you kind of alluded to that you load up the, the destination hive, the one that's going to get the new queen a little heavier. Right. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, that's a great question. So this this is this could be both. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, the, the one that is going to be the new split, I might instead of three frames of brood in the middle there, I might give them a fourth frame of brood. Um, but in general, th this is kind of the basic format of all the splits that we do. Um, regardless of which one is which this is this is the same basic principle. So great question. Um, so the last thing to keep in mind with, uh, with splits is just feeding. They, they are typically going to need quite a bit of food. It's amazing how quickly as bees are growing, how, how quickly they eat food. So don't neglect the food. Don't, uh, usually when we're doing splits, we like to feed them as we're putting the new queens in. And so feeding them pretty much right away is, is important. So, all right. Well, if you have any questions about splitting, feel free to put them in the chat. And if you're, if you're in the middle of typing, then uh, we can always come back to it and answer any questions that you have um, about splitting. I know that was a pretty quick overview, but um, like I said, Skip did a great job of, of digging into that pretty deeply last month. And Blake, I did also miss one other question from earlier. Sure. When you were talking about the flow. <clears throat> Eric asked, how much variation do you see in the honey flow across the Metroplex? They are 18 miles due east of Dallas, and is your late April, early May still a good time frame for the start of their honey flow? Yeah, that's a great question. So not a lot of variation. I mean, you see a little bit from, from south of Dallas, between Dallas and Fort Worth to up near the Oklahoma border. Uh, you know, you might see, you know, a week at the most, at the very most of difference. So yeah, I mean, even up in the Dallas area, yeah, I'd still say you're, you're looking at probably the very end of the last week of April or the first week of May, still pretty accurate, yeah. You don't really get into um, much of a difference unless you get really far south, you know, Houston area, you know, some, San Antonio, um, all of North Texas stays on roughly the same schedule. So great question. Great segue. Uh, oh, yep. Sure. Yeah. So Harold has asked, how long do you feed the split? Really good question. Yeah. So as far as how long you feed the split uh, in general, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about feeding in a minute, but you're generally going to feed them until you're ready to add your honey super. And so, you know, it's time to add the honey super again, second great segue here to adding supers and when to add supers. The, the, the typically the time we add supers is when, our brood nest becomes, or our brood boxes become about 80 to 85 percent full of bees. Uh, of bees, and that's when it's time to add your next honey super. Um, and so, you know, once you're once you're if you're if you're feeding your split and you get it to a point where it's about 80, you know, you open the lid and it's about 85 percent. You know, eight of those frames are covered with bees. Uh, seven to eight of those frames are covered with bees that's about when it's time to slow down on the feeding, stop the feeding and start putting your honey supers on. And, and you'll see a lot of that this time of year. I mean, it's, we're, we're getting close to the time where you'll start adding honey supers if you have existing hives. Um, even if you're buying hives, I mean, if you're buying full hives, um, I know that we were out looking at single story hives that we're about to start selling this week. And, um, you know, I was telling the folks at, at our store that, Every person that buys a single needs to have a super ready because they're just bursting at the seams. And, and so even if you're buying bees, um, you know, you may still need honey supers fairly quickly. Um, so, but the general rule of thumb is 85%, 80 to 85% full means it's time to add another super or add a super. And that's when you are going to stop feeding. And then once that super becomes about 80 to 85% full of honey, um, then you can add your, your second super. Quick note on queen excluders. Um, the general rule of thumb to keep in mind with queen excluders is uh, when you add them, 
they always go between your brood nest and your honey supers. The, the goal with queen excluders is to keep your queen out of your, uh, out of your honey supers. You don't want her getting into your honey supers and laying. Um, but you never want to put it on uh, if you have a box of foundation. So if your, if your super is not drawn out yet and it's still foundation that hasn't, the bees haven't added wax to, um, you do not want to add your queen excluder yet because bees almost 99% of the time refuse to draw out new comb through queen excluder. They don't like going through a queen excluder to draw out honeycomb. So if your supers are foundation, put them directly on the hive with no queen excluder, let the bees get started on it. Let them, you know, draw out a couple of those frames in the honey super. And then you can smoke and shake all the bees down. So you make sure your queen isn't up there uh, and then put your queen excluder on and the bees will kind of continue that work. So um, just be careful. You don't add that uh, queen excluder. If you've just got a box of foundation, if you've got a box of drawn out comb, you can add it as soon as you add the honey super. That makes sense. Any questions on that, Mike? Yeah, there's another question somewhat related. Uh, when do you add the second deep to your split? Like mm, great say, question. You split a two deep hive into two one deep hives, but eventually you want to add another deep, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the the raging debate in North Texas. <laughs> All the times is you know is your brood nest one deep box. And, or is your brood nest one deep and one medium or is your brood nest two deeps? And then everything above that is honey supers. Um, you know, it, it, it just kind of depends on what your goal is as a beekeeper. Um, if your goal is to grow your hive numbers, if you really want to split every single year and grow your hive numbers, having two deep boxes is a great idea as your brood nest. Because every year they're going to be drawing out more brood nests for you to split, you know, make more splits the next year. Um, if you really, really just want to make honey, um, I usually recommend just having a deep and a medium as a brood nest. And then everything above that is your honey supers. The problem with two deep boxes in North Texas is that we don't, we don't make a ton of honey in this area. I mean, we, you know, I would say about 40 pounds per hive is, is pretty average on a normal year. A deep box can hold about 60 pounds of honey. And if you've got two deep boxes, obviously a lot of that is brood, but it's conceivable and you see it sometimes where they pretty much don't need much beyond those two deep boxes. I mean, all the honey kind of ends up between those two deep boxes and then they don't always put anything in supers above those two deep boxes. So, you know, if your goal is just make honey, uh, then you might want to consider just having a deep and a medium as your brood nest. And then that allows them to kind of just fill that deep and medium just with brood. And they're going to store more of that excess honey up in the, uh, up in the supers above. Um, if you really want to grow your bee numbers, I recommend two deep boxes. And that, that gives, you might still make some honey but two deeps as well. It's just a little less likely. So, sorry, that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> but, uh, but same, you know, no matter why you're adding another box, this, the principle applies when a box is about 80% full of bees, time to add another box. So whether that's your honey super or another brood box uh, for a brood nest, same principle, about 80% full, time to add your next box. And, it, and if you are just adding a brood nest and not a honey super, keep feeding. So you want to stop feeding when you start adding your honey supers because you don't want the bees just to store the sugar water up in the honey supers. Um, if you're adding just a brood nest, keep feeding and they can keep filling that brood nest full. Um, one trick that I found to running two deep boxes and still making a pretty good honey crop is I keep feeding. Um, uh, until the honey flow starts, of course, but I feed as much as I can to get them to fill those brew boxes with as much honey and brood as I can. Because if I get them to the point where uh, both deep boxes are pretty much full of honey or, or syrup, really, uh, stored syrup and brood when the honey flow begins, well, then I can add honey supers and they don't have any room to put it in the two deep boxes below because I've got it full of brood and, and syrup and they're just gonna move all the honey right up into the honey supers. And so that's kind of a one trick you can do if you wanna run 2D boxes and still make honey is you know, just get them to kind of pack those boxes out with brood and honey, and, and then they'll move the, the real honey up into the supers when, once they start bringing it in. So, all right, Mike, I'm sure we have 
yeah, a question there. A couple more questions. Uh, what if you have drawn out frames for supers, but only enough for one, and the rest are foundation? Would you put the foundation frames on first or second? Or mix, I, mm. I guess I would add. Good question, good question. So yeah, Mike, I would, I would go with you. I would go with the mix. And I like doing that because uh, you'll often see that the bees will draw out those new frames faster if you have some comb mixed in. Um, so, so yeah, I would kind of do every other frame comb, every other frame foundation, and then they're gonna kind of jump up there a lot faster and start drawing it out faster. So yeah, I'd, I'd go for the mix. Okay. Uh, then Russell asks, are you concerned about your brood boxes getting honey bound when you were talking about feeding syrup and right up until you add the supers? Yeah, so that, that's something you just, you kind of have to monitor as you're doing it. I mean, yeah, you don't want to feed so much that you've got three frames of brood in the bottom and, and 10 frames packed out with honey up top. And, you know, that would be too much. So, so you don't want to feed that much. You just kind of monitor the situation and you know, like, like right now, I mean, I know that we're about roughly two weeks out from the honey flow. And if I've got three frames of brood in the top and two frames of honey and every, all the rest of the frames are empty, well, I'm going to feed pretty aggressively um, to, get to kind of fill up the rest of those. Oh. Was I the only one hearing that? No, no. I heard it. Okay. <laughs> well, you guys might want to put yourself on mute. Uh, Hopefully it wasn't me. Um, so yeah, so you know, you just need to monitor the feed levels and not not feed so much that they're going to get honey bound, but enough that they're going to fill it out. Um, the bees are pretty good at at leaving room for the queen too. And usually, what to me, what that's going to look like is about a gallon a week. Um, we'll usually get them there. You know, uh, you know, if you're feeding like three or four gallons a week, then they're certainly going to get honey bound. But usually, a gallon, one to two gallons a week will get them in about the right place. So any more questions, Mike? Yep. Um, so from earlier, uh, when you were talking about, um, well, I'm not sure exactly when this came in, but the question is what should they do with excess winter honey frames in the brood boxes? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so if you've got excess honey frames uh, left over from the winter, if they're, if they're just, I mean, if, well, I guess it depends on where they came from. I mean, if, if you've just got leftover, you know, if they're in your, in your brood box and your brood box is full of bees, that's fine just to leave them there. I'm going to assume that they're a problem, like they're in your old honey super or you've got too many of them and you need to get rid of them. Um, the best thing to do is just put them out, you know, 20 or 30 yards from your hives and let, let your bees rob them out if you need to get rid of honey from the previous season. And the bees will rob it out and store it in the brood nest and use it. And then you can reuse that empty comb however you need to use it. So yeah, just putting it out on a nice warm day and usually takes the bees about a day or two and they'll empty it all out and you'll be good to go. Well, another question is uh, Dave has one deep of drawn comb, but he wants to draw out another deep. How should he time adding those boxes and in what order above the brood box? So um, if you want if if you want that second box to be a brood box, um, then you can just put it on top of your existing hive when it's you know when your bottom you know when you whenever your existing box is on the hive or eighty percent full, you can put that deep a foundation on and let the bees draw it out. If it's just for another brood box, you know you can keep feeding them and they'll draw it out faster. If it's the honey super, you know, again, you're going to want to um, stop feeding um, once the bees start drawing out that comb and, uh, and they should hopefully finish drawing it out with honey. So it kind of depends on what you're doing with it. You know, if it's just a brood box or you just want more drawn comb, you can keep feeding them and they'll draw it out a little faster. Okay. So then someone asks if, uh, or in the scenario where you've kind of overfed them in the deep right before you add the supers, Will they not move some of the syrup up to the supers? Yeah, that's a really good question. It, you know, it's it's conceivable that they would do that. It depends on how how overfed they are. You know, if they're like you know sixty pounds of honey and in, in that second deep, and they're desperate for room for the queen, yeah, they'll start moving things up. 
you know, if they've got a mixture, you know, if they've got a couple of frames of brood up there and the rest is honey and they've got a bunch of brood down below, um, they won't necessarily move it up unless they're just desperate for room for that queen to lay. So um, if they're to that point, you know, to where, you know, there, there's nowhere for the queen to lay, what I would do is I would just pull out a couple of those frames of honey, set it out, let the bees rob it and then add it back in and, and you know, certainly stop feeding for a while uh, to give that queen some room to lay and, and, uh, and then add your honey supers. Usually if you add your honey supers, you know, when the honey flow is really beginning, they're usually just going to start, you know, putting honey in there because they need room for that honey. They're bringing in more urgently than, um, you know, than, than not. So, but again, if they're honey bound, you know, so much honey that the queen has absolutely nowhere left to lay, then yeah, pull a few of those frames out, let them rob it out, give her, give her some room. Okay, this one's a, a bit of a long scenario, so bear with me. Uh, last year, this individual had a hive that was a deep and a medium at the beginning of the season for their brood box. By the end of the summer, the brood nest ex had expanded to become the deep and two mediums. He left it like that over the winter and now see that the bottom deep is again mostly empty and they are in the two mediums. Question is, how does he convert the deep medium medium brood nest back to a deep end medium? Keeping yeah. in mind that great the question. box is mostly empty now. Yeah, great question. So there's a simple solution for you. So you're just gonna reverse everything. So take your two medium boxes and put them underneath your deep box so flip everything so your empty deep is now on top of the two mediums start feeding them a little bit not not you know a gallon a day but give them you know a steady trickle of food i would say a gallon of syrup per week and what's going to happen is the bees are going to start moving up bees like to move up as a general rule of thumb rather than down and so after hopefully after about two weeks or so uh three weeks your bees are going to have moved up at probably at least into that second medium and your top deep and you can pull that now empty medium box uh on the very bottom out and and reuse it so yeah you just reverse everything give them some food keep some food on them and they'll they'll start moving up and empty out of those mediums down below okay i think we're caught up awesome great well uh Okay, so speaking of feeding, we've already actually touched on a lot of feeding, which is great. So this time of year, and I know most of the year I just harp on over and over, maintain about a 30 pound excess of honey or stored syrup in your hive. This is one of the times that does not apply. So this time of year, you know, I'm going for a minimum of 10 to 15 pounds of stored honey or syrup. Um, I don't wanna see them drop under that, but I'm also not going for just a ton of stored uh, honey or syrup this time of year because the honey flow is right around the corner. So, you know, th the goal this time of year is to make sure that they have enough so that on these cold snaps, they're not going to starve to death. Make sure they have enough so that, um, you know, as they're rearing a tremendous amount of brood, they're able to have all the food they need. But I'm also not looking for an entire box of excess honey on my hives right now. So, uh, this time of year, you know, most of our hives were feeding about a gallon to a gallon and a half per week is a pretty normal flow rate and we'll do that up until the start of the honey flow no need for pollen substitute bees are bringing in a tremendous amount of pollen so no need at all for any form of pollen substitute and then you're going to end feeding in late april or early may um, when you start adding your honey supers now the caveat out there is if you made splits or if you're buying beehives or buying nooks especially if you're buying nooks and this is your first year doing that um, then uh, you're going to keep feeding until your bottom box is 80% full and then you're ready to add your honey super. So you might be feeding later past that late April, early May date um, because your hive is still growing and that's perfectly fine. Um, the rules are a little bit different when you've got a, a brand new nook. So any questions on feeding, Mike? Nope. Okay, I probably said that fast enough that you couldn't type it fast, that they uh, couldn't type it. So Good. sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, and actually, I missed one. So okay, so go for it. They actually posed this a little bit ago. So sure. if you feed a lot of syrup, as you said earlier, and then add super for the for honey, will the syrup be used as capped food during the winter, 
And if so, is there any issue with that? So there's no issue with the bees, you know, eating that cap syrup during the winter. Typically though, they will have cycled through that capped honey long before the winter. You know, they, they, they eat honey, you know, they'll, they'll have long since eaten all that by the time winter rolls around. So they refresh their stores pretty frequently. But good question and, though. And, and one new one, how full should the bottom box be in a nuke before you stop feeding? So in a, if you have a, nu a nuke, um, you know, it's going to, most nooks are about five frames when you get them. And so those five frames are typically going to be already drawn out or mostly drawn out. And so that's, you know, five of the nine frames in the bottom deep already drawn out when you start. So once the bees have started drawing out those two outside frames, so frame number eight and number nine in your bottom box, that's usually when I'm adding a second box with a nook. So once they draw, start drawing out the eighth and ninth frame on the very outside, that's when you know, you're ready for the next box. And how long that takes varies, varies depending on the weather, just on the strength of the nook, your, your region, you know, a lot of different factors play into how fast to get there. But, uh, but generally, yeah, look for that eighth and ninth frame starting to draw it out. You know, once they've got a softball size bit of wax on the eighth and ninth frame, you know, ready for that next box. Okay, great. So, oh, there's just a picture. We talked about drawing out foundation. And so we kind of already touched on all that, but you know, that's a picture of the bees getting started drawing out that wax foundation. If you ever have a quick side note, if you ever have old frames that are foundation left over from the previous year that maybe your bees never got to, and they've been sitting in your garage or something, uh, you really need to um, work on those before putting them onto your hive. Once foundation that has not been drawn sits for a while, in a couple months, and it'll get a fine layer of dust on it. And if you can't like put it to your nose and really smell the beeswax, then there's a good chance the bees are going to struggle drawing it out once you put it in the hive because they, they really want that fresh coat of beeswax on it. So you can recoat it with beeswax. You can buy a block of beeswax, melt it down in a crock pot, uh, that you no longer want to use for food because it never quite comes out. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you can melt it down, you know, get a little paintbrush and brush a light coating of melted wax over that frame. Um, you can also uh, just, uh, and I've done this before, it's a little more fun. It's also a little more dangerous. Uh, get a, a blowtorch and, and just from a distance, or you know what's a lot safer that works too is a uh, hair dryer that's on high heat and just kind of remelt the wax that's already on that frame um, that was there when you bought it. You know, when, when you buy it, most frames when you buy them come with a coat, you know, thin coat of beeswax already on it. And so if you can just kind of remelt that beeswax that's already on there a little bit, that works too. So just a little, little side note there. Here's another question. Um, sure. They had uh, double deeps and they mm -hmm. were busting at the seams, so they added mm -hmm. a, another deep to try to avoid a swarm. They okay. Had, they had two hives in the same situation. It okay. Bees did not swarm, and now the third deep has bees in it. <laughs> okay. And we used the third deep as a split and add a queen to it. They did put excluders between the second and the third deeps at the beginning of it all. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, at this point, um, you know, you could certainly make a split. And, and, yeah, you can absolutely use that third deep. You can even pull some brood out of those bottom two deeps and, and make a split uh, out of that third deep. Depending on how much syrup has been stored up in that third deep, you might be able to just leave that third deep on as your honey super. You know, if they've already got a whole bunch of syrup stored up in it, then that's not going to work as well. But, uh, but, yeah, absolutely. Use that as, as a box to make another split. Nothing wrong with that at all. So, all right, one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. Alex inherited a bunch of frames that were drawn, uh, but the wax is old and brittle. Should he melt this down with a hair dryer or a heat gun? Yeah, good question, Alex. Um, it's kind of hard to say without seeing it. It kind of depends on how old it is. So, um, bees will often re condition and repurpose wax on their own. The, the rule of thumb 
for me is if it's so old and brittle that if I drag my finger across of it, across it, it crumbles, not, not just kind of pushes over, but if it, if it just crumbles and it's so dry that I can just kind of get a hand, you know, crush it and crumble it. Um, I wouldn't, I typically, yeah, I, I wouldn't even bother, um, trying to save it at all at that point. I mean, you could try to scrape everything off and recode it with beeswax. Um, and, and they might take it. Um, it's just kind of, if it gets to that point, it's hard to salvage. Now, if, if you just touch it and it just kind of pushes over and doesn't just totally crumble and it's totally dry, but if it just kind of pushes over, um, I'm trying to think of a better example, but, uh, then, then the bees should use it just fine. And you can always just stick a frame in a hive and see how the bees react to it too. So good question. Another, mm -hmm. uh, Dave, uh, is adding the medium super that has baited or that's been painted, I guess, with melted wax, mm. but will still need to be drawn out. Will the bees draw out that foundation if he uses a queen excluder? He wants to avoid queen laying brood in the super. Yeah, so good question. Unfortunately, yeah, the bees still have to draw it out. You're still going to need to hold off on that queen excluder, assuming your whole honey super is like that. If you just have a couple frames of foundation that's been recoded, um, mixed with a you know a box that has already drawn out frames in it, then no, you don't. You know, you can go ahead and add the queen excluder. But if you've got a, a whole box that's completely undrawn out frames, even if you've recoded them, you still got to give the bees a chance to get started on it um, before adding the queen excluder. Now, I, you know, that doesn't mean that you, um, you're going to get a ton of brood up in your honey super. You just, just leave it on there for three or four days. Usually let the bees get a softball sized piece of comb drawn out on three or four of those frames and then put your queen excluder on and, and they'll keep drawing it out. Um, so, you, you know, you might get a, a half a frame of eggs up there in that time period, um, but they'll hatch out long before you harvest honey so um so it's not usually an issue but good question okay so um let's talk a little bit about and um i'm gonna go a little faster here uh but let's talk a little bit about requeening and installing nooks um and we're not going to talk a lot about it, installing nooks because i'm going to try to direct you guys to a resource that'll help you if you're buying nooks this year um I was going to try to uh, send it to you guys uh, on here. Maybe I'll talk to, to Lisa and Russell and Mike and see if we want to do this or not. But maybe after the call, um, I can e we can email you guys out some links. But one thing we did last week, because so many people are stuck, in, stuck inside and can't go to bee meetings and can't then we made uh, four or five different videos that are each about anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 minutes long. And we did a video in the bee yard on how to install a nook into a hive, um, when to, looking at real hives, of course, when to add honey supers or additional boxes, um, how to decide what kind of feeder to use. And then we just kind of did a walk through a beehive to where we, you know, I just sat down at a double deep and went through frame by frame and said, Hey, look, here's brood. Here's the queen. Here's larva. Um, and then we also did a split. I mean, I'm sorry, a nook to where, Hey, here's a new nook, but here's how you take it out of the box. Here's how you install it in a hive, et cetera. Um, and so maybe we can email those videos out. Um, or if you just go to YouTube um, and go to uh, the Texas bee supply channel, um, if you just go to YouTube and, uh, I guess you can just search Texas Bee Supply, and uh, and that that those videos will come up. All they're all on YouTube. So um, anyway, so I'm not going to get into that too much because we've got a whole video on, on how to do that. As far as requeening, um, whoops, whoops, too far. Um, let's talk just briefly about because this is also the time of year where a lot of folks requeen. Um, I want to. I'm going to move through this fairly quickly because I can't believe how much time is flying. Uh, you, got, you guys are way more comfortable asking questions on here than in, in the talk <laughs> <laughs> normally, so, um, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, but I want to talk really quickly about finding the queen because it's a question that comes up so often and it, it's frustrating and it's tough to do. I want to give you some of my best tips that they're not terribly helpful because it's still just hard to do. Um, 
But uh, one thing, the way I normally find a queen is uh, one, where you look is important. The queen is typically not on frames that are nothing but capped honey. And she's typically not on frames that are almost completely capped brood. She's going to be on a frame usually um, oftentimes on the outsides of the hive uh, where there's some room for her to lay. So if I pull up a frame and it's ca completely cat brood on both sides, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking for the queen on it. If I pull up a frame and it's got some cat brood but a whole lot of open cells, um, I'm really going to look carefully at that frame because oftentimes that's where she's going to be. She wants to be laying eggs, so she's going to be where she has room to lay eggs. The other tip, and I, I tried to kind of illustrate it in these pictures here. Um, I, I didn't. I need to take some better pictures. I need to do a video on how to find a queen and illustrate some of this. And I, we're, we're going to try to make a, a lot more videos later this week because, again, this is such a critical time of year and so many people are stuck inside. But um, we're going to try to make four or five or six more videos towards the end of this week. But So if you guys have any suggestions on videos or things you would really like to see, um, let us know and we can we can send those I can make them and send them to Lisa or Mike and they can send them out to you guys and be happy to make some videos but um, if you see this top right picture let me see if I can okay I can scribble can you guys see me scribbling on the screen yes oh that's kind of cool so I can I can doodle uh, while we talk do be talk um, so <laughs> this upper picture here so this is this is how most of us look at a frame right we pull it out and we kind of hold it um, parallel to our face and look for the queen. That's not a great way to find a queen. You, you can do it, but you're kind of almost having to look at every single bee to find it. And so when I'm looking for a queen, that is not how I look for um, the queen. I'm looking for her like this. So when I'm pulling up a frame out of the hive, um, I am almost looking um, vertically uh, down the face of that frame. Um, and then once I pull this frame out of the hive, instead of uh, before I look at this frame, I'm gonna doodle too much. Now I can't show you what I'm trying to do. But before I look at this frame up here on the top picture, I look at this frame down here. So I look at the face of that frame that's still in the hive and 90% of the time, that's how I find a queen because when you're holding this frame out of the way and you're looking at this facing frame still in the hive, the queen, as soon as she kind of sees the light, she turns and starts walking down the frame because she wants to be where it's dark. And when she turns and starts walking down the frame, <clears throat> the first thing you see is her abdomen. And that's the most distinctive difference between her and the worker bees is that huge abdomen. And it is so easy to see the queen as she's walking down that frame on the frame that's still in the hive. So that's my best suggestion is when you're, when you're going through the hive, pull the, fr pull the frame out. Before you look at the frame in your hands, look at this frame still down here in the hive. Uh, um, and uh, oftentimes I'll see her turn and start walking down. If I don't see her there, then I kind of look at the frame in my hand, but I recommend holding it a little more like this um, or even out of the hive, kind of looking down um, the, the, you know, down the face of the frame instead of holding it just flat up against your face. And you'll often kind of see her at that angle as you're kind of skimming your eyes across the backs of all the bees, kind of looking down that frame. So um, <clears throat> I'll try to make a video on that. So that'll probably be a little clearer in a video format. Um, but that's, that's typically how I, how I find her. So and Blake, someone's asking that once you pull the frame completely out of the hive, do you flip it over to look at the other side? Absolutely, yeah. So once you kind of look at that frame, you know, on one side on your hand, then yeah, flip it and look at the other other side for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Great question. So requeening, um, I'm going to skim over this pretty quickly just for the sake of time because there's a few other pretty important things I want to touch on. But, uh, you know, timing wise, the month of April is when a lot of folks, that's the most common time to requeen. Um, you know, how often? I usually recommend every year just because you never know when your queens are going to fail and most queens fail at some point in their second year. Um, and so uh, I usually do it just on a schedule every March or April, requeen every year, every hive. And uh, 
you know, if, if, if you can't find your old queen, you know, we talked, I think last meeting about, you know, shaking all the bees out, <laughs> putting a queen excluder between your bottom board and your bottom box and shaking all the bees out of the hive and giving it a couple hours. And then your queen will be trapped between the bottom board and that queen excluder that works. It's messy, but it, but it does work. Um, and, uh, but usually about once a year, I try to, um, requeen. I usually requeen after I do my splits. And so I go ahead and make all my splits, um, and then requeen the old Queens because it's a whole lot easier to find that old queen in a split with two or three or four frames of brood and a third of the bees than in a double deep full of bees and brood. It's just so hard to find when they're that strong. So I, I wait till after my splits and, uh, and then find that old queen and requeen cause it's a much smaller hive at that point. Um, if anybody needs queens, let us know. We've got uh, actually a hundred extra coming in this week that we thought we were going to need that we don't. So um, if you need any extra, let us know. We've got some extras this week. Um, just keep in mind when you're putting the uh, queen cage in the hives, um, this is how you put it. You, you want to keep that screen open uh, or, or facing outwards. You don't want to smash that screen on that cage up against the frame. Um, you want to leave it open so the queen can, of course, breathe and the bees can interact with that new queen and get used to her. And then we talked about it briefly, but checking back on that queen to make sure she was accepted, you know, wait about seven days. Uh, it usually takes the bees two to three days to release her from the cage and then takes two, three, four days for her to start laying. And, uh, and so about, about seven days after you install that new queen, go back and, and check for eggs. And we kind of talked about that process in the beginning. So... I won't dwell on that too much. Any questions on requeening, Mike, before I move on? Uh, no, other than someone missed your comment about having extra queens. Oh, yeah, just we, we, we have about 100 extra queens this week. So if you need some queens, um, let us know. You can shoot me an email or text or just reach out to Texas Bee Supply, and we've got an overstock this week. So if you need queens, then... Let us know. Um, so this is definitely swarm season. Uh, I'm sure you guys have noticed that this is definitely the uh, time of year when hives are swarming, wild hives are swarming. You're probably getting all the swarm calls. Everyone's also at home right now, so they're all noticing swarms a little more than normal, I think. And uh, we're certainly getting a lot of calls at the moment. And uh, a couple quick notes that the Swarm prevention is all about space and making sure your hives have the space that they need. So make sure that, you know, once any box on your hive gets about 80% full, time for another box. And so you just really have to stay ahead of your hives um, space needs in order to keep them from swarming. Once they start raising queen cells, so you can kind of see in this picture up here, you know, you can see these queen cells they start raising. And uh, once they start doing that, it's really hard to prevent them from swarming because once they get it in their heads, they want to swarm, man, they just, they often swarm. You can try wiping out those queen cells. Nine times out of 10, you're going to miss one and they'll swarm or they'll just keep trying to raise new cells. The best and only thing I've found that really prevents a hive from swarming is splitting it. And so if you've got a really strong hive, they're drawing queen cells out everywhere. Um, I just split it. And, and make two or three or four splits out of it. And that's the only way I've really found to prevent the hives from swarming. Um, this is a video. Let's see. Oh, come on. Let me see. Oh, there we go. So this is actually a video. Hopefully you guys can see it when I hit play. But um, this was, I, I, I was out in the bee yard uh, Friday and, and a hive was swarming. And so it's always kind of a crazy thing to see how fast they come pouring out of the hive uh, when they're getting ready to swarm or they're swarming. And so, so this is where I did not do what I encourage you guys to do. <laughs> this, this hive was about 110% full of bees and uh, I didn't get a box on them in time and they, uh, there they, there they went. So you can see them just pouring out and yeah, zoom back a little bit. They uh, clustered on a cedar tree and I uh, dumped them in a new box. And they were gone by Monday. They didn't care to stay, so <laughs> pretty typical. All right, any questions yet on that, Mike? Yeah, Blake, uh, someone's commented that they've picked up a few swarms and they want to know how many hives 
can they keep in one location and they're kind of out in farm country? Okay. Yeah. So in, in, as a general rule of thumb in North Texas, about 15 to, okay. So let me back up. If you want to make a honey crop, then about 15 to 20 producing hives, uh, per location is, is about what's going to max out the, uh, flowers in about a two mile, one to two mile radius in North Texas. Now, if you're not so concerned about making honey and you're just raising bees and making splits, I mean, here in North Texas, you know, a lot of our bee yards have three, four, 500 hives in each location. Um, but we're not trying to make a honey crop yet. We're just making all our splits. So, um, once you're ready to make a honey crop and the honey flow starts, you're going to need to get it into, you know, 15 to 20 or so per location to make a good crop. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. So here's a couple more questions. So do you move the newly split hive, the two miles away, the one that you're adding the new queen to before or after adding the new queen? So, um, yeah, good question. I, I move them first and, and then feed them and add the queen. So, cause you're going to want to let it, you're going to want to let it sit off of the old hive. So you're going to want to take it off the old hive and sit for about 24 hours before adding a new queen. Okay. So, yeah. Then Russell's asking about the number of bees disappearing the queen pheromone. Too many bees causes a swarm, right? Yes, that's, that's accurate. Yeah, so I mean, that's, a, that's another, um, another reason the hive swarms is once they have, you know, 100,000 bees in them, um, then yeah, you can, they can not have enough queen pheromone to go around, especially if your queen's getting older. Uh, and that, that can also cause them to swarm. Um, but it's also a factor of the time of year because you see hives in the middle of a honey flow that have 100,000 bees. and uh, you know, three or four deeps full of bees and honey and they don't swarm because they're in the middle of a honey crop. So it's kind of a factor of what's going on, you know, what time of year it is, how full they are and queen pheromone. So yeah, kind of a lot of different triggers for, for swarms. But yeah. Great, great comment. Um, and someone asked, though, I think you answered it. Should you lock down a swarm in a new box for a certain number of days? Actually, you were talking about the split, not a swarm. Mm -hmm. So what was the question? Should you lock down a swarm in a new box for a certain number of days? Oh, no, I wouldn't. I mean, I, you know, it, you risk them overheating. And uh, oftentimes I've tried that in the past. And I'm not saying it doesn't work for some folks, but, uh, you know, oftentimes they end up leaving anyway. Um, so... The, the, the best way for getting swarms to stay in a box that I found is to give them a frame of brood. And so pull a frame of brood out of a strong hive if you already have, put it in the box, dump your swarm in, and oftentimes they'll stay uh, if there's that frame of brood there. So, yeah, that's the best, best method I've found. All right. And Alex is asking, if you're using a deep for a swarm trap, do you fill it with empty frames? Yeah, if yeah, I, I would. I mean, you don't, may not have to fill it up completely, but uh, I think it's better to have frames in it than not if you're using it for a swarm trap. Yeah, that way, if you you know a swarm moves in and three or four days go by, then uh, you know they'll have something to start working on. But uh, but the, yeah, I would wonder is the distinction whether they're bare foundation or um, oh foundation or oh yeah. I mean, comb is going to be more attractive to bees for sure, um, but. Uh, you know, you also risk wax moth damage if, if they're going to sit out there for a month. So if you're only letting it sit for maybe a week or two, and then you're going to take it down, I think a few frames of column is a great idea. Um, you know, if, if you're going to let it sit out there for longer than that, you might want to just consider the foundation. But uh, yeah, good questions. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, this is just a couple random things. So um, I know we've got uh, 15, 20 minutes left or so. So I, I, uh, I was supposed to make this bee talk last a little bit longer, which we've done more successfully than I'd imagined. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, I'm just going to flip through a few pictures that I threw in here to extend it that I thought were kind of fun, some things that we're doing right now, um, beekeeping-wise, things we've tried this year. And feel free to ask questions. And I'll kind of hurry through these because this isn't what you guys got on to see. You got to 
you know, you got on to hear tips uh, about bees. So um, one thing we tried this year we've never done before is uh, we had a bunch of queen cells shipped to us while they're still queen cells. Uh, we've never done that before. You know, queen cells are very delicate. Uh, these are before they hatch. Um, I'll show you a picture, but this is, a, these are queen cells before they've hatched. Um, and, uh, and so they're very, very delicate. And so obviously shipping them through the mail is, seems a little crazy, but we, we tried it for the first time this year. We ordered from a guy in Louisiana and he shipped them to us. And this is the box they came in. He had padding in there too. Uh, and they worked incredibly well. Um, we had uh, 90, seven percent hatch rate so 97 percent of them hatch successfully uh after having been shipped through the mail for two days so who knew uh, I, I i was leery that it would work but it, it actually did uh, we get mated queens all the time in the mail but uh, we'd never tried uh queen cells before they hatch shipped in the mail and it uh worked surprisingly well so it's kind of cool this was just uh, i'm sure most of you guys have seen it before but uh speaking of queen cells we got some videos of some queens, some virgin queens emerging. Now they're not supposed to be doing this in an incubator like this one is. They're supposed to wait until you get them into the hive, but uh, these these little ladies didn't get the memo and uh, <laughs> they hatched out too early. But uh, it's always pretty neat to see them chew their way out and, and hatch out. And you don't want them to do this because then they go and start fighting the other virgins or stinging them and um, you know, you, you gotta get them in a hive before they hatch ideally. Um, we've been in the middle of splits and building nooks and I just thought, you know, it's kind of a neat picture to see in that, that top picture. We, uh, we do splits during the day, but we, when we build nooks to sell or use ourselves, we do that at nighttime. Um, usually, usually we'll start at about four o'clock in the morning and then we'll, we'll pull nooks out of hives until about eight o'clock until it starts getting warm outside. And uh, you can see we're using a forklift light <laughs> to, uh, to, to see. But um, th so what we, the reason we do that is to, to build a nook. Um, we pull two frames of really good brood out of a hive and then two frames of honey and, uh, and, that's, and then put a feeder in it. So we've got two frames of brood, two frames of honey and a feeder and a nook box. And then we put a queen cell in it, out in the bee yard. That's that lower left-hand picture there. That's when we put them out in the bee yard to, put queens in them. Um, but the reason we do it at night is we, we need all the bees we can get in that nook box. And so if we were to do it during the day, you know, you start pulling frames out of a hive during the day and the bees start flying and running and it's hard to get a frame covered with bees to get into a box in the middle of the day. Well, if you get out there at four o'clock in the morning, um, you pull up a frame and all the bees stay on it because it's dark and often cold this time of year. And so we're actually able to, to build these nooks and keep all the bees on those frames uh, and then transfer them into a new yard at sun up and put a queen in. So, so that's what we've been doing every morning. But, um, and so that, yeah, that was actually the last, uh, the last slide. So definitely stay safe. And uh, if there's anything that you guys need, let us know. And um, hopefully we're all together in May, but if not, Maybe if uh, you guys want, maybe we can do this again in May. So, um, so yeah, I guess at this point, let me, let me jump back out of this, but I guess we can open it up to any questions that anybody has about any other beekeeping topics or yeah, anything go ahead and, I missed in Bethel. Go ahead and stop sharing your screen. It, it says you're still okay. doing it. Whoops. Uh, okay. How about that? Yeah. Okay. That'll okay. Work. All right. All right. Uh, All right. Two, two, or actually, I guess now three late questions. What's a reasonable price range to expect to pay for queen cells? Um, so queen cells are obviously much cheaper than mated queens because you cut out about two thirds in, of the process by doing a cell. Um, these days, they're four to six dollars in in bulk. Um, maybe up to $8 if you're just getting a couple of them. Okay. And then somebody is asking, why would Texas Bee Supply buy queen cells instead of mated queens? If the breeder is good enough to supply the queen, wouldn't you think that they are? No, I wouldn't think it's that you don't trust their mating genetics. 
<laughs> yeah. So a lot of breeders don't actually sell mated queens at all. And so you often have breeders that um, sell mated queens and you have breeders that just sell the cells. That's a tongue twister. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, a lot of breeders just sell the, the individual cells. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but, uh, it's also a price thing. I mean, you know, a mated queen is going to cost anywhere from 25 to $40 and a queen cell commercially is going to cost four to $6. And so, um, it's obviously dramatically cheaper, which is another reason to use queen cells. Okay, and two other late questions. Actually, one of them is an old question that I, it was asked out of sequence, I guess. Uh, so in putting in an undrawn frame, the question is, is it okay or is it wrong to put it between drawn frames to encourage them to draw that middle one out? Yes, absolutely. And that's how I would do it. Put it between two drawn frames, yeah. Yep. Okay. And do you have any tips or tricks for managing supers during the off season to keep wax moths away? Um, yeah, I mean, wax moth crystals, uh, freezer, um, those are the two best options. If you have the freezer space, then the freezer works. Uh, I know some people that will freeze their supers for a couple of days to kill all any, any wax moth eggs or larva, and then they'll seal them up really well in a trash bag. And that, that works pretty well. You want to check them just in case, but, um, but uh, that or, you know, use wax moth crystals. Okay, Russell, are we at the general Q&A now? Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm half tempted to let people unmute themselves and ask their own question, other than we may have all 50 people ask at the same time. Uh, or we can keep doing it where I try to keep up with the questions and ask them as we go along, which which do you want to do? Well, we can try to open it up so you don't have to read each one. If you want to try that way, maybe monitor it, and if it gets out of control. So, conference call etiquette: if two people start talking at once, back off. Don't keep talking and concede one to the other. So, whoever has a question first, go ahead. Now, that's assuming everybody knows how to unmute themselves, which is a, a button or control at the bottom left of your Zoom screen. It looks like a little microphone and we'll have a red line through it if you're muted. So, uh, and yes. All I have a question. All kinds of people are unmuting, so let the free-for-all begin. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Samir. I have a question. If I am planning to replace the existing queen with a new queen, how long before I should take the existing queen out of the hive, whether to keep her or kill her? That's a different question, but how long before getting the new queen I should uh, take her out? At least 24 hours would be my suggestion. Blake or John, y'all have any different? Yeah, yeah tw 24 hours. And, and I wouldn't wait longer than we, I made a big mistake this year that, I was experimenting and it, it failed, fa failed miserably. Um, so I waited about five days to put some queens in. Um, and what I found is once I waited, if I waited to the point where the bees were beginning to cap over their own queen cells, because when a hive's queenless, they start raising their own queen. If I waited to the point where the bees were about to start capping their own queen cells, even when I put a new queen in, um, they never tore those old cells down. And so what would happen is my new queen would emerge. Those old queen cells were still present in the hive and they would have the virgins would then hatch out and kill my new queen. And now, you know, I just lost my new queen and I've got a virgin queen that's going to take two weeks before she starts laying. So, um, so I think there is a sweet spot in there. I totally agree about 24 hours is ideal, but don't wait longer than ideally three, three, uh, no more than three days, ideally. I thought the released queen would go after the capped. Well, that's, that's, that's the book I read too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
apparently not. Um, I mean, women, about, women don't about, always do what they say. <laughs> about, uh, I mean, about half of them did. About half of them. I mean, this was on a couple hundred hives, but about half of them did. They they tore the the, old, the new queen tore the old queen cells down and killed them. But about half of them didn't, and they hatched out and killed the new queen. Yeah, we got in a situation where Thank we you. didn't have time to. Um, you know, wait that long. So we just thought, okay, let's just kill the old queen, throw her back in there, put her on top of one of the frames, and then put the the uh, the queen cages in there. Hundred percent success. Yeah, so that that works pretty well too. I mean, you know, twenty four hours I would say is ideal. We've done it like you've done it, where we kill the old queen, put the new queen in, and usually we have pretty good success too. So you don't you don't have to wait that long. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's it's interesting how different things. But we but we made sure we put the old queen back in. We just didn't pulverize her. We just squished her enough to kill her, and mm-hmm. then put her back in there. But it was like a little funeral procession around her. There was a big <laughs> circle of mourners, right. the dead queen. Right, right. So was the caged queen, or was the new queen in a cage, and they had to release her? Yeah, yeah. It's just the, the same way. They just had to release her. So it did take time, but then they. I don't know the theory behind it, but maybe they realized, oh, she is dead because she's in there and her pheromones are going down and the new ones, but. Okay, we've got Harold has his hand raised. Uh, just a question. If you, um, you're you pulling out some of your old wax from last year and you, you see some mold on it, do you scrape it off? Do you give it to the bees to let them take care of it? What do you do with that? As long as it's not excessive, like an entire frame covered in mold, you know, if it's just a patch, I put it back on the beach. They do a pretty good job of cleaning it out. Anyone else? And there were a number of questions I didn't read that came in right at the end. So if those individuals want to go ahead and ask their questions themselves. Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions. One I didn't send in which is, um, Blake, when you order the queen cell, is it, am I the one echoing like that? I think so, but I can hear you. Go for it. Okay, let me turn my volume down, see if that changes. <laughs> okay, uh, when you order the queen cells, why are you not concerned about, um, I guess, with whom, with what stock she mates with when she does mate i thought that was a big concern about mm-hmm. purchasing or the reason behind purchasing a mated queen was mm-hmm. to control the stock it is better. yeah yeah because that's 50 percent of the genetics right so um so it depends on what we're doing with it um you know and a lot of the pictures and stuff i show is for desert creek honey our commercial beekeeping operation versus texas bee supply so it's sometimes two different things depending on what kind of queens or nooks or genetics we're selling but um for for queen cells one of the big reasons we do that commercially is we kind of are controlling the genetics because commercially we'll have two or three hundred hives per bee yard and then two miles away we'll have another location with two or three hundred hives and so we're kind of flooding the region with our drones from our own hives of our oh, own known genetics gotcha. um, versus if you're a small scale beekeeper then you've got four hives and you put queen cells in, you know, they're just mating with wild drones. So commercially, yeah, we kind of have saturated the region with our own drones um, okay. of known genetics. Okay. Big difference. So, the other yeah. question yeah. I, that I actually submitted was, uh, I, I'm hoping somebody remembers what this is. Um, there's a problem that develops due to allowing the queen to lay in the super. And I don't remember what that is. Do any of you, anybody on the, on the call remember what that is? It's like, if there's a recommendation to not let the queen lay in the super because that leads to some other problem. And I don't remember what that is. Honey super? Yes, in the honey super. Well, you have brood in, in your honey super, but by the time you harvest your honey, the brood should be hatched out. And I've actually accidentally run brood through the extractor, extractor and they survive. And they survive the, the whole process. So it's not necessarily bad that you have the queen up in the honey because they will go down if you have 
uh, plenty of putting. Blake, you have a different answer? No, no, um, I agree. Nope, I agree. Mm, I, that's mm, – I have to keep digging. It was something else. I don't remember what it is, and I was trying to remember. Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah. Uh, Alex, see your hand raised. Yes, sir. Uh, so first of all, thank you for this. This has been very, very helpful. Really, I think we all really appreciate it. Um, the the question I've got has to do with walk away split, and if I see you know five six queen cells being formed, and I don't want to lose those queens, and I build a little square out of like hardware, you know, one eighth inch hardware cloth and just stick it into the frame there and save those queens and then put them in some other small nukes? Yeah, so you're talking about letting that cell hatch in those little cages and then taking yes. that virgin queen and putting it in nukes? Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, that works. I mean, you, you, gotta, you need to get to her fairly quickly. She's not typically going to live for just days in that cage. So as long as you get to her... I would say within a day or so after she's hatched, then yeah, that works. Okay, thank you. You bet. Anybody else? I got a quick question. Mm -hmm. So have you ever accidentally uh, grafted a drone egg into a queen cell, like a queen cup? Uh, yes, I have. What happened? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I've actually seen them raise a drone in a queen cup. So, yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like a queen cell. You know, the bees know the difference. And so instead of like a big, long capped queen cell, it's just like they, they cap it off right at the surface of the queen cup, kind of like they would a normal cell. Isn't that okay, so the drone overall looked about the same, though? No, I mean, you, you could definitely tell it was a drone. And even, by the way, they capped the queen, the, the, the cup, the queen cup, you could tell it was a drone. It was like not nearly as long as all the rest of them. It was like really short and level with the opening of the queen cup gotcha. versus sticking down. And yeah, so it was just kind of really a special confused drone. So <laughs> the other thing we had was uh, we joined a little late. So could Russell uh, run over the announcements again? Not much to announce. Not much to announce. We uh, don't know about next month's meeting. It will, I hate to uh, guess either way, but I'd like to have us all back together again. But um, more than likely, I'm going to say it's probably going to be this type of venue again. So, Mike, have you heard from Collin College if they already canceled May? They haven't said yet because they're. Initial cancellation date was the, through the April 18th, and I've not heard anything since then. Okay. Yeah, I mean. So we'll wait until we get an announcement from Collin College. I mean, the picnic's been canceled. Um, summer Clinic, TVA Summer Clinic, has not been canceled at this point. I don't know if you've heard anything, Blake. Uh, no, I haven't. I mean, like everything in the world right now we're just waiting to see i mean it, it's june so we've got a little bit of time but i mean i think we'll make that call probably in the next month for sure but i mean I hate to say it but yeah. you might hold off buying your paying your reservation just yet um, yeah i'd say it's about a 50 50 shot right now yeah. well there's and a lot of there's a lot of openings in the club if you were willing to volunteer <laughs> But that, that's a that's a big announcement there. Hey, it's e it's easy when you're on Zoom, yeah. <laughs> well, and with regard to the summer clinic, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but as the webmaster for TBA, I've been asked to remove it from the website. Uh oh. That says a lot right there. They didn't say it was canceled. They just told me to remove it from the website. <laughs> right. So I mean, like I say, everything's up in the air until everybody gets the ball rolling again in the city government we don't know what's going to happen so just play it by ear a couple weeks out we'll know just plan on being flexible i guess yeah yeah and michael cohen has been unmuted for a while now michael do you have a question you wanted to ask
I guess not, so I'll, I'll mute him. Will the board meeting also be on Zoom next month? Next week. I'm week. So. Yeah, it'd have to be. <laughs> we, we actually split it last board meeting and we kept it under 10. Some people came to Spring Creek. Uh, we didn't have Zoom at that point. We then opened up uh, just a phone call. There were, prob there were problems with it. So this Zoom has worked better. And, and we can't meet anywhere for even a small group face-to-face. -face. So I'd say, yeah, let's do Zoom. And then do we send an announcement out to the membership so they can join if they wish? Sure. sure. It's always been open to the public. Just they, very few people came. They can, they can see how easy it is, and, and then I'll jump right in and volunteer. That's right. Okay. <laughs> I have a quick question for Blake. Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Um, you said you've got some spare queens for pickup this week. I went on your website. Are they the Carnies or the Cordovans? They are the Carnies. Okay. Just yep. double checking. I'll, I'll call tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're the Carnolians. Staff knows there's some availability. Uh, they will buy them tomorrow morning. Yes. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Quick, quick item for Russell. Yes. I sent you an email for a possible calendar person if you don't have one yet. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah, you are uh, Harold. accepted. <laughs> it's not me. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to pay me anything. <laughs> it only costs you 10% of the, of the product. No. <laughs> you get a free calendar out of the deal. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll look for that email. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's just in the, it's in the notes in the chat notes right now. Okay. Okay. That's great. Uh, we also have a question had... for Russell. Someone asked this early on. I, I joined way before the meeting. So someone asked, I think, before the meeting, is it possible to continue this format even when the regular um, meetings resume? Maybe for those of us that um, <laughs> are far enough away that we might end up missing if we try to get there, but we could jump on real quick and and log on this way. Is that a possibility? Well, it takes extra resources to keep this, to facilitate this. It takes a gotcha. dedicated resource. Okay, gotcha. I mean, um, and, and then one last question. This is kind of for everybody. Um, I had something develop in uh, one of our hives I'm pretty sure is chalk brood and the only thing that I have found as a treatment is apovar I haven't read all the details about it but if anybody's dealt with it before and successfully treated it um, please let me know <laughs> yeah uh, yeah, Apovar is really for varroa mites. It really doesn't help with chalk brood. Um, the two things that are going to work best, well, three things with chalk brood is just time of year. Bees typically get it when it's cool and wet in the spring. As long as it's not really severe, like frames covered in it, they often outgrow it. Requeening does help. Um, the other two things, uh, um, probiotics. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the one that we use. I just blanked that Pro DSM. Uh, probiotics those really help a lot okay. the other thing you can try and it sounds really weird um, but is a banana <laughs> um, oh. if you yeah get a banana cut it in half long ways and just squish it on your top bars and um, oddly enough about half to half or more of the time it, it seems to work so yeah really? try yeah, that. yeah. Um, and it's great to have bananas in the bee yard so <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I would try the banana. If that doesn't work, then I'd try the pro DFM. The pro oh, diet. okay. That, uh, yeah, banana, that works a lot better. Uh, what I saw, it mentioned Apovar or anything that, um, was thymol based. Uh, oh, well that would be, um, Apigard, um, is oh, thymol based. Okay. Um, okay. But, okay. but I, I'd still, I mean, if you need to treat for mites anyway, sure. You can use Apigard and it might help with the chalk root as well. But, uh, okay. if you don't need to treat for mites, I wouldn't, I would just, Try the banana first. These days, a banana may be harder to get than probiotics, but, <laughs> but try try the banana, okay. and then if that doesn't clear it up, I'd I'd use the 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 probiotic. Oh, nice. Um, 
so technicality does it matter whether i cut it in half and leave the peel on or do i do i just leave the flesh or the flesh um, the peel leave the peel yeah the peel or just flesh. leave the peel mm -hmm. yeah the whole no all of it it's the whole thing peel and the flesh oh peel and the flesh mm -hmm. okay okay mm -hmm. yep yep wow okay so another thing that i've i've been doing i've just kind of been uh i guess experimenting somewhat with um with my hive is i have alternating frames of frame with foundation and then a uh, foundationless frame alternating and what i notice is that the the brood that they lay on the foundation that i'm sorry on the wax that they drew without foundation uh all of that brood seems to be healthy compared to so is is there any correlation between foundation and chalk brood or not that i've ever heard no okay um i mean yeah the chalk brood is based on a fungus um so I don't know. I've never heard that before. Good question, but I've never seen any research that would indicate that. So okay. and I see somebody just asked about plantains versus uh, versus bananas. I don't know. <laughs> um, oh, okay. I would experiment okay. with it. And see, I don't. I don't know where you're finding plantains, but I guess I guess Whole Foods in some places sell them. So um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I would I would stick with the banana, but it'd be interesting to see if plantains work. Okay, so the is it something about the bananas that kill the spores? Yeah, there's a there's a chemical in the banana, and I, I can't pronounce it. It's really long, but it's it's what kind of gives the banana its distinctive smell. Um, it's yeah. very similar to the alarm pheromone um, in right. the hive too, um, but it's theoretically um, that uh, that's that's what theoretically that's what kills it. So okay, well praise yeah. God, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's give it a shot. All right. Hey Blake, it's Lisa. Hey. So we just got our um, hives back from California. We got them split. We found some varroa mite. Mm -hmm. Can we treat? Yeah, I mean it's just it's getting pretty late. Um, mm -hmm. I mean if you're if you're if you're wanting to make a honey crop, then you're kind of limit. If you don't want to make a honey crop, sure treat with anything. You just may not be able to harvest honey. If you have a varroa mite problem, though you're, you're kind of limited to some of the really short fast treatments like the oxalic acid um maybe a single dose of apivar um, um, apigard i'm sorry um uh, you know yeah reuben a uh, thermal treatment would certainly work absolutely um so anything that's fast and short you just can't have that 40 day withdrawal period right yeah. okay uh trey green you have your hand up I is actually his mom. Um, he's got this on for scouting and stuff like that under his name. Um, I'm with Mary and her family. How is the scholarship program, do you think, going to be affected? I talked to Skip a couple weeks ago, and he said for sure he wouldn't be able to distribute anything. But um, any news, any changes, any information at all on that? John? Well, what we're looking at right now is a way to be able to get uh, small groups together uh, in the bee yard so we can keep, get the kids in there and all. We're looking at something to do because we want them to be able to get out there in the yard and see that. And we will be maintaining their nooks until we can get them here. But uh, we're trying to find some way to get everybody together. That's just very few at a time. Okay. Thank you very much. If there's anything that we can do to help or whatever, let us know. We're excited. All right. We are too. Any other questions? I would just well, mention that there was an announcement loop that I was trying to run before the meeting actually started. And that will be posted on the website along with our other announcement loops. Okay. Hey, Mike. Um, I've had uh, you know processed several requests on the Facebook closed group for people that were not members. I've sent them to the website. They had trouble finding how to pay online. I think I saw where you had modified something to simplify that process yeah on the join page where the 
app membership application is, I've added a link to the online payment option. So what I've been telling people is still fill out the application, mail it or, you know, shoot a picture of it and send it to me, but then go ahead and pay online. And someone just did that this evening. So two different locations, I get the application under join and then go to the market or? No, on that same page then is a link to go to the okay. online. That's new, that wasn't there, was it? Correct. Okay, okay. All right, thanks. Any other questions? I was wondering, I guess, in between the meeting, um, of course, I mean, we're not available in between meetings anyway, but if people wanted to, you have questions for the, the club, the board, whatever, if you're not already following the added to the group, the closed group for members, get on there and ask to join. And even if you don't know the password or whatever, you know, we, we look up every one that applies, ask to join the group. We look up to see if you're a paid member, but that's where you can ask for assistance, post questions, you know, anything in between meetings. And we try to respond same day, at least usually within an hour, at least someone in the club will respond to a post or a question. It's an open forum, pretty much like this. So if you haven't already asked to join the closed group, do that so you can continue communicating. And, and that's specifically Facebook. We also have the Yahoo group, which does it via email. Okay. Any uh, questions? One last time. Okay. Uh, board meeting will be next Monday night, 6.30, on this same format. So... A unique meeting ID, so I'll send a notice out to the membership list with that meeting ID, with that connection information. Okay, great. Wow. Okay. Um, well, I just say uh, let's call this meeting adjourned and hope everyone liked it, got something out of it, and uh, this has been a big month that uh, we didn't want to miss, so. Again, thanks everyone for uh, helping out with this and contributing. So, and just FYI, we had I think a peak of seventy-two people attending. That's wow. good. Yeah, probably more than one person in like us, two in one location. So that could be doubled easily, or more. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> good job, everybody. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, you Ben. Thanks, guys. All, All right. Bye-bye. Talk to you guys soon.